Dreams are what you make of them, but how can you make anything of such dreams when the real world is more chaotic than dreams could ever be? The 2022 indie rhythm game Melatonin is a unique little game that plays well as a chill out experience for most gamers and is deceptively more difficult to play at times than you think at first playthrough, despite the game's artwork and soundtrack giving the impression that this will be an easy game to play through once. However, metatextually, Melatonin says a lot more about millennials, zoomers, basically my generation's place in this world, and how we don't have 100% control of our lives and our environment, dreaming or in waking life. Not that this matters since there really isn't a concrete story going on, but there will be spoilers from this point on as I will be going through each level and trying to explain what is really going on in the game's world and on a deeper level, an interpretation that is relatable to anyone playing it for the first time. So, bare bones explanation for what is happening in the game. Your playable character is essentially an aimless, directionless, and wandering millennial lost in her life by the look of their room each night. This person has no direct dialogue or thoughts and doesn't do any major actions on their own apart from sleeping and waking up. Pretty much their life can be summed up as just passing by without taking in each day. Each night they might be checking in on social media through their phone, skimming through television, or trying to better themselves through my mindfulness meditation practice. Then, a while later, we see that the character has fallen asleep and into the dream world when the thought bubble pops up above their sleeping body, and if you notice how each playable stage is arranged, it looks like the layout of a shopping mall, and I think creating a dream world mall for level selection is no accident on half a sleep's part. Malls are an escape when you are younger, a way to make some use of disposable cash to dispense of, and maybe after zooming through a few stores and doing some impulsive shopping. You might want to pick up some new Nike kicks, a sweet sweater or two, or some new video games. Hell, you might have tried some of the mall food in between impulsive shopping, which if you're high school age, I wouldn't really recommend it, especially when you're not thinking too much about what foods you need to eat to maintain a balanced healthy diet. Basically, if you happen to live a middle upper class childhood, you don't think too much about the cost of living when you're younger in high school, and it's easy to overlook this when there's so many items like kicks and games to check out. And of course, your circumstances would have been different if you grew up in a lower slash working class family. But then when you're older and money becomes a delicate matter when you have to learn how to budget and manage your finances, you don't get as excited as you do when you go to a mall for an hour or two. Being a young adult spending time at a mall, even for an hour, feels like walking as a zombie at the end of George A. Romero's Dawn of the Dead. Not as excited as you once were during your childhood or teenage self as you walk aimlessly passing by stores. Yet this place feels oh so familiar to you, reminding you of a past which was taken for granted. Sci-fi horror analogy aside, there are in fact circumstances outside of your control where you're not in complete control of what happens to you financially, such as inflation or wages not keeping up with productivity. Despite some folks, maybe even your own family, who will respond with such observations and say something along the lines of, and I don't want to hear about the fucking economy either. I don't want to hear it. But it's easy to see how the fear and worry of trying to get by each day and making a living could make one want to stay up all night and maybe even fear the very thought of trying to sleep off these fears, even if dreams are better than the real world. So I don't know about you guys, not that you fine folks watching would care to know or not, but I am a bad, terrible sleeper when I am caught up with a task which needs to be completed. Whether it's a song which needs a catchy chorus or a guitar solo in between verses, an acrylic painting I'm trying to see how I can finish with happy little brushes here and there, and it can be a struggle knowing that sleep might not always be the cure for coming up with new ideas, even with a small little video essay like this one in which, admittedly, I may have had to deal with a severe case of writer's block at times. Which wasn't always the case, and while I am surely not the only one to feel this way, as life goes on and our bodies get older, 
after, as we get closer to the inevitability of death and become more aware of our surroundings and especially the state of world affairs, our lives and environment, it can be hard to lie down and relax the body in bed while so much is going on in our lives and around the world. Not even counting sheep could alleviate the worry about the circumstances we can't control throughout our lives, and even in the ways in which we have some amount of control, like our relationships with our family and friends, our high school or college or even postgraduate, our jobs and our everyday activities and hobbies, we forget that there's only a limited amount of time in waking life to spend on these activities and chores, and practice how we would do one thing or another, and even less time to daydream or sleeping dream, that is if we can even remember our own dreams. To give an example of what I am trying to get at with dreams and reality, one reoccurring dream which used to pop up during my sleeping nights is this one where it's the end of my senior year in college and I am looking over my report card showing all of my courses to see which final grades I received before I leave off into the real world. But as I am sitting in the classroom at a desk examining the card, there's this one course at the end of the card with the name of the course blurred so I can't remember what it was that I was supposed to complete and the final grade reading incomplete. Of course, I know in the real world, I did graduate from college with a philosophy degree, but that doesn't stop me from thinking and overthinking and analyzing the dream every now and then. And even now, I wonder if that incomplete grade in the dream is me putting off graduate studies due to work and or because of the fear and worry of being hammered with costly student loans from graduate school and having to pay them off until I can no longer dream. Maybe you felt that way as well, that there's a void in your life which you want to fill. Maybe it's a master's degree or a PhD, a creative project you've been pushing off, or maybe a hike at a national park you've been trying to plan out and visit eventually. But reality kicks in, and you might not have the time and money to do it, except maybe in your sleeping dreams. So then, what does this have to do with this small little indie game entitled Melatonin, which bears the name of the hormone that helps you with your sleep-wake cycle and also the over-the-counter medication you take in case you need help sleeping. From looking at the cover or looking at the official Steam store page for the game, you might get the impression that the game is going to be an all-around pleasant time, and for the most part, it's pleasant in a relaxing way if you're not thinking too much. However, apart from the frustration in trying and failing to achieve a perfect run with each level, the game's lo-fi, aesthetically pleasing appearance is incredibly deceptive, and after playing it a few times on my Mac, book, I can think of two things that are happening which are left unsaid due to the lack of dialogue, and this will be brought up here and there within the essay. One, the game's character has to hustle in real life in order to make their dreams become reality, and two, the character's environmental factors, upbringing and political factors outside of their control, hinder any success they might have in making their dreams come true. It is possible to interpret the game's events in an optimistic way, but as it becomes clear towards the end of the game, our main character character's relationship with their dreams and reality are stuck in a loop of anxiety, fear, and come with the misguided hope that a good night's rest will lead to a better tomorrow. There are studies out there which try to explain how dreams can be beneficial, of course, and which might contradict the interpretation I got from playing Melatonin and for which I kept in mind as I was writing this script. Case in point, this one from the University of Geneva, in which the researchers looked at parts of the brain to find how our dreams prepare us to face our fears in real life. They found that, where brain areas like the insular cortex or insula and mid-singulate cortex were implicated as areas in which fear and dreams would allow these areas to process adverse stimuli, or stress, in waking life according to their research. Finding that dreams help us react better to frightening situations, and when playing the game while the team at half asleep may or may not have been aware of this research, you could see how certain dreams can calm the character's fears. That is, if you have an optimistic read on the game's events. Or even this study from the University of Notre Dame in which the research team concludes that dreams can help productivity while discussing the dream reality relationship and how it carries over in the workspace. To paraphrase the authors, a positive approach to dreaming promotes resilience and can help with making progress throughout the day. However, and this is where I become skeptical of the implications of this study, this article wasn't written for a neuroscience publication like the previous study, but in a business management one, which makes me think that the research is less about how dreams can 
make people more creative than how CEOs and bosses can better tame their workers and not get them to think about better pay or labor conditions. So to use an appropriate example from the game, when I am playing the work level during Night 2, and as we'll discuss in the Night 2 chapter, the character's work shift routine becomes less about how they can become more productive, more creative workers, than how they won't rock the boat anymore while at their desk and stick to doing the most mundane tasks from 9 to 5. Anyway, before we can dissect what each dream in the game is trying to say about our lives, I want to talk a little about the gameplay mechanics and the music of melatonin. Melatonin is a short but addicting and catchy music-intensive gaming experience. Specifically, the game involves the player keeping up with a music beat in order to complete challenges. And really, what better way to chill and play than to play along with one of the most chillaxing soundtracks in recent indie gaming history? While I wouldn't say that the soundtrack's 100% perfect, you can tell that each level's given song is appropriately placed where it belongs within the time between night one and the final morning before the game ends. Just to give a few examples, the song for the stress level is panic-filled while your character climbs and jumps towards each ladder to avoid the creeping lava. The work level song creates a lot of electronic noises in the background, like computers and printers going off as you're sitting at your desk doing whatever mundane tasks given like email. And the game's final song, New Day, suggests a rather optimistic conclusion for the main character, which conflicts with my interpretation of events and analysis, but more on that later. Anyway, the tutorial and practice modes are meant to get you used to the mechanics of the game, usually either pressing the space key at the exact beat during one stage or maybe the arrow keys on another. Of course, this is different for gamers with a controller, but for this playthrough I played with my MacBook. The player accumulates a score depending on how many perfect beats you get in sync with, and you climb up the meter to the left of the screen while playing, moving up when hitting perfect notes but getting penalized for pressing too early or too late, and the player's meter goes down if missing a note completely. There are four final score achievements you can get on score or hard mode. Decent, great, amazing, and perfect. Thus, one can beat the game by doing the bare minimum without overstressing about being in sync all the time. It is possible to achieve a perfect run by getting all the notes correctly on a level. There's even an option in your menu which lets you play on perfect mode, where your playthrough ends the minute you miss a note or either hit too early or late. But getting through perfect requires more than having your speakers on. Headphones may be necessary to pay attention, at least for me. This format for playing seems simple enough, especially if you're shooting the shit and not trying to achieve perfection for all of the levels and are fine with only getting up to great status. But for those gamers who are also involved in the music arts, I find that the game has multiple benefits. Helping with reaction time and keeping up with tempo. The latter part is what I want to explore and discuss now. So besides being a video essayist, I am also a musician, writing original singer-songwriter music, mostly on classical or electric guitar in my spare time, when I am not making sick beats inspired by the greatest, invincible, fearless, sensual, mysterious, enchanting, vigorous, diligent, overwhelming, gorgeous, passionate, terrifying, beautiful, powerful hero in all of video game history. <laughs> Yet, one of my biggest problems in making music is staying in tempo without a metronome. Practicing, recording, and playing back my recordings to see if my guitar strumming is at the right tempo. I didn't realize that melatonin would appeal to me on the music front as well, and how the game was useful in keeping up with the pace of a level's given beat. Strategically speaking while playing, one technique which helped me a bit, as I was starting to get used to the gameplay and for you watching who are musically trained, was to learn how to move my head to the beat while tapping and pressing keyboard buttons in sync with the kick drum of each song without pressing on it until it is necessary. Sometimes nodding my head was useful, neck pain aside, as I was having difficulty with a tech level on hard mode or even trying to get through basic tutorial practice like on the stress and desire levels during night 4. Of course, the game gets easier when you're getting used to hearing the songs repeatedly with each level, and the only consistent difference between score and hard modes is that the game is usually sped up on hard mode, but if you want to shuffle things up, the game's level editor can come in handy. 
With all that out of the way, it is now time to explore each dream and what they are trying to say, at least from where I'm sitting. Speaking of which, dreams and the act of dreaming can be incredibly helpful and useful for creativity, and for artists, they always bring the potential to inspire dense and interesting art, and melatonin is no different. As the game says in its description, it's about the merging of dreams and reality and how they play off each other, an element found all across multiple pieces of entertainment and art, from writer-director Christopher Nolan's mind-warping dream within a dream action flick Inception to the many films of David David Lynch. Of course, it would take days, even months, to dissect how many works of art, books, films, paintings, records, and in this case, video games, have explored and tried to examine and dive deep into dreams, and that would just take too long. But as a gaming piece of art, Melatonin is not really a game that you have to overthink as a casual gamer. To know that the main character's diet consists of pizza, burgers, and donuts, to name a few fast foods, as shown in their apartment, and in the first level in Night one. It's a diet you don't have to think too much about when you're a teen or young adult, but not so much when you're approaching 30 or 40. And diet becomes a bigger concern as your metabolism slows, and you might save a few pizza slices for a cheat meal while staying healthy with proper diet and exercise. Yet maybe when you were playing this game for the first time and you're aware of the cost of living and grocery store prices going up due to inflation, this character's diet is essentially a shoestring one. As you might infer from playing the other levels in the game, they can't afford all the healthy or fine dining expensive food. But, like I said, they still need to get by each day, one way or another. Likewise with the shopping level. As I was tapping my point finger on the space key on my keyboard while trying to be in sync with the beat, I kept getting distracted by all of the items showing up that, in real life, would take a good chunk out of my bi-weekly paycheck for my 9 to 5 when I really wanted to go on a spree. Sure, being an adult means books become more precious to read, to keep my mind engaged, and maybe one book haul a year won't hurt my finances long term. But being younger and making monthly trips to the local mall, it was extremely tempting not to try and see how I can manage to buy three pairs of Nikes or Jordans within a $300 allowance budget just so I can show off at school, or maybe on the basketball court while trying to shoot impossible threes like Diamond Dame. Nowadays, however, just even thinking about buying the latest pair of LeBrons, KDs, or maybe some retro Jordan 5s could take away an emergency payment for a medical emergency when my car needs a repair or, God forbid, my dog has to go to the vet in case something happens to her. So I'm thinking thankful that I can afford at least one good pair of shoes a year. Hell, as you get older, you become even more grateful that your parents, aka Santa, never forget to buy you new pairs of undies and socks. See also, for example, the tech level, which makes me grateful for my keyboard and controllers I have to try new games and retro games whenever I can get the time, as with right now with melatonin. The placing of the followers level in the game during Night 1 is very telling, as it's the last before Night 1's remix. The first three levels in Night 1 all deal with consumer products and your character being a consumer. Food, which is necessary to live, shopping, and tech, which are more about wants than what we need. All three of these categories of products being products of capitalist consumerism. The fact that you might have a cell phone in your pocket, or maybe a laptop that has internet access, means you have access to social media platforms like Instagram, Facebook, or even YouTube, and going viral on social media becomes another avenue for potential revenue for users when their day job is not enough to keep up with the cost of living. You are no longer just the consumer of social media, and getting fed through the algorithm, eh, this word, content, but you are now a creator of media, and that creation requires hours on end of work, spending time and labor even when that labor goes mostly unpaid at first. You could say making social media itself as a beginner is another form of unpaid internship, even if you feel like you are your own employee. To go back to me being a dog owner for a moment, I can't even begin to tell you how many Instagram dog accounts I have come across and scrolled while Instagram or TikTok surfing, from all shapes, sizes, ages, and breeds, where their owners, aka the social media creators, capture their pets doing various antics and internet memes. And the more I am exposed to this phenomenon, it becomes more clear that this trend of social media posting becomes less about the love you have for your dog or cat or whatever pet you have, and more about how you can use your pet as a bank, another stream 
stream of revenue due to minimum wage jobs not keeping up with inflation and the cost of trying to make it day by day skyrocketing. Of course, it doesn't even need to be pets we're talking here. Countless YouTubers, TikTokers, and others all try to make some living through social media in order to avoid the mundanity of a 9 to 5 desk job, as the work level in Night 2 of the game shows. Followers means money and social power and status, but for the majority of people, it is only something one could really dream of. Since Night 1 is a decent introduction to what's ahead, and you are mainly relying on hitting your space key, it's easy to trip up here and there at first playthrough, even while practicing how each level works before entering into score mode. But after a second run through, it becomes second nature. There are levels here which are straightforward, chopping on food thrown at you in the food level, cashing out in shopping, shooting back and tech, but the followers level might trip you a little since it turns this game into a semi-platformer, at least for the moment, where at first you feel unsure as to whether or not if you miss a beat, you might fall down, but of course that's not the case. Again, Melantonin isn't an excessively difficult game so much as it's a musically intensive game. The difficulty comes when you're not paying attention when you hit a beat too late, or if you're impatient and pressed too early or miss completely. The following night features dreams about the activities you need to do to make the best out of the mundanity of young adult life. Exercise, work, money, and dating. Exercise is much easier than you think, like an hour long walk outside is a pretty great workout when you're not thinking too much about fitting an ideal body image of yourself. But as you can see when your main character is pumping weights next to their residual self image, despite the amount of work they're putting into working out, their body never changes to look like their counterpart even after completing the level, though I will say that a basic lifting exercise like bicep curls won't suddenly turn you into early 2000s era Barry Bonds. The money level is more straightforward. Dreaming about getting rich while never having to do a damn thing for your wealth is something a majority of people would love to happen in their lives. Some people wish they would find money falling right out of the sky like raindrops, but I like to think more people like myself dream about finding a bag of money lying on the sidewalk and never reporting it to the police. As someone wise once said, Man, money ain't got no owners. Only spenders. Moving on, as I was saying regarding the previous night, when you're older and especially right out of college, money becomes a little more delicate, as you might not be so inclined to impulsively shop as you may have done when you were younger, and you may have likely been told by your parents to get a real job. Even if you didn't have a day job while studying in school, it's a difficult transition from having a schedule of classes at college to mostly being static at a desk job, doing god knows how many dull tasks at your work computer. Of course, as I said earlier, the work dream in Melatonin is more catchy and engaging than the real 5 days a week work shift at your desk. In reality, the hopeful future once visioned by John Maynard Keynes, who predicted that the advancements in automation would lead to a 15 hour work week, were crushed by our present timeline. Workers giving meaningless work, as the late anthropologist David Graeber wrote in Bullshit Jobs, mundane, dull, and psychologically tolling when you tie it all in with the Protestant work ethic of work equaling self-worth, and oh yeah, even today that ongoing pandemic we're supposed to pretend isn't happening despite crushing the labor force with long COVID. No matter how many times you try to deny the creeping thought or ignore it, the attempts to improve yourself as a worker, or for that matter, go above and beyond around the office prove futile. Never getting commended or hardly getting perks and realizing far too late in your adult life that the typical capitalist fantasy story of working harder means being able to accumulate more wealth and prosper more as opposed to the reality of all your work being more about how you can put more money into your boss's pocket. Yet this is supposed to be the norm in the ideal capitalist society we live in, where the self-help Protestant work ethic culture is brutal to our humanity, yet it's a necessity to survive and no dreaming can alleviate it. The dating level has an appropriately placed blues theme with its song, as you keep swiping with your left and right arrow keys, with each emoji face appearing and disappearing. It also has a similarity with the work level, in that given that the character remains single even after completing the level and not settling with a potential romantic partner, since no other characters from our protagonist's family or friends appear outside of the dream world, it's another reminder that, in a heavily individualized society where we're off on our 
our own, the toxic idea that not being romantically involved lowers your self-worth creeps in. If only we had the ability to dream potential romance. Moving on to the next night, we see that the main character is trying to meditate in front of their television with eastern ambient meditation music in the background, their room a little more organized than previous nights before, with their pizza boxes and other food thrown out, and some plants surrounding them on the couch, only for our character to doze off while sitting and back into the dream mall once again. And this night's dream suggests that they are trying to be introspective about their life and are wanting to self-improve, to finally fix their existential crisis through a practice you might have heard before, or even practice yourself, knowingly or not. Mindfulness, being aware at the present moment through meditation. At the time level, you swing at flying clocks with a wooden baseball bat while keeping in sync with the beat. Subconsciously, I couldn't think of a sport more appropriate for this game's level than baseball. Not just simply because it's my favorite sport out of the four major American team sports, but because baseball, a uh, pun not intended, is often called America's pastime, a relic of a history and memory people my age grew up with and maybe played a little recreational baseball as a kid like I did. Of course, baseball is still played today in the present, thus it's a timeless tradition, and by smashing clocks, we're trying to stop time in its tracks and focus on the present moment like our game's protagonist. Then again, this level could have two meanings, positive and negative, and the flip side is trying to stop the present, and for that matter, the future, from happening and trying to go back to a past which was more fulfilling. Next, as someone who started meditating when they were college age and who meditates infrequently since then, I'm not sure of the meditation level was actually about meditating and more about hypnosis given the clocks, as hypnosis, like certain forms of new age meditation, has its own history of woo-woo attached to it, but there are some anecdotal accounts of people who say that it helps to focus on weight loss or staying positive. Mindfulness, on the other hand, is a lot broader of a subject, one which is inherently tangled with its relationship with Buddhism. Despite almost all practices of pop mindfulness meditation being secularized and or co-opted by new age groups. Hell, I can go on a whole tangent about the complicated and problematic relationship between mindfulness and capitalism, i.e. the distinction between the Buddhist concept of mindfulness versus the mindfulness industry which not only secularizes mindfulness but is co-opted by large corporations and businesses to help workers or to tame them into being submissive to their working conditions. But that would be a wholly politically charged video for another time. Self-help and improvement is one thing. In fact, it can be a good thing to have a little self-care. But again, some circumstances are just out of your control. No matter how you try to change your ways or even if meditation or maybe praying attempts to improve yourself based on self-help advice or pop psychology only individualizes how you can help with all of the ups and downs in the world. And that's a reoccurring theme during Night 3 in Melatonin. Night 3 is the most positive of the four nights and probably my favorite of the four to play, but in a way, it is also the most revealing of the truly darker nightmare beneath the game's surface. Okay, I kind of lied when I said I wouldn't be diving into other art that deals with dreams during this essay, but sorry, I can't help myself. So, I can remember over a decade ago in my philosophy one-on-one -on -one class watching Richard Linklater's 2001 rotoscoped animated film Waking Life, in which the main character perpetually drains through philosophical discussions on existentialism, the meaning of life, and the nature of dreams, lucidly dreaming through one philosophical discussion or monologue to another. I think a lot of young adults going into college taking one philosophy course or another can relate to how Waking Life's protagonist feels and transitions from dream to dream, lost in life with little direction yet still yearning to learn a little more about what it all means. Maybe I am speaking from a place of bias since philosophy and religious studies was my college degree, but the fact that there is no concrete, set in stone meaning to life, unless one subscribes to a religious one, means that altruism is necessary to benefit the lives of those around us, not just during our individual lives but collectively, society as a whole, whether it's through government policy or even in our local community 
communities. The problem arises when society, including government, individualizes all of our problems and makes it so that trying to better society as a whole is impossible, or for that matter, taboo to even think about. Philosophy can go a long way in examining what is the right thing to do as an individual when faced with an ethical dilemma, and a lot of the answers, when provided with some well-sound logical reasoning with evidence, are clear as day. But at the end of the day, most philosophical discussion is navel-gazing, hardly solving society's present institutional problems and maybe even stagnating the solutions to such problems. Just going around in circles again and again, as hard as it is to admit as a philosophy major. You can be an anti-capitalist and be justified in arguing through reasoning that inaction on climate change is wrong, but one sound, well-reasoned philosophical argument doesn't solve the problem. Radical action has more impact. A protest against the construction of a pipeline or a boycott of a fossil fuel company has more legitimacy than one argument. This is why, while I find that so many theories and discussions on dreams are interesting to read as to how people came to believe what they're trying to say, the interpretations and discussions of such dreams don't solve the dreamer's problems, or for that matter, go on to solve bigger, more complex societal problems. At the end of Waking Life, the protagonist is just like the protagonist of Melantonin, aimless and still with little direction, yet intrigued by all the philosophical discussion as he keeps lucid dreaming, whereas our protagonist protagonist has to wake up to reality and face the music. It's cool to think about dreaming and examining such art forms that deal with dreaming. However, as much as I love to think about my own individual dreams, dream interpretation is mostly just another form of navel gazing. And we don't even need to get into some of the far out there religious or new agey interpretations of dreams. And sure, to paraphrase UC Berkeley neuroscientist Matthew Walker, the author of Why We Sleep, dreaming can provide a form of emotional first aid, yet dreaming is not a cure for society's problems. Going back to my reoccurring incomplete grade college dream for a moment, it would be easy for me to say that there was something metaphysical or out of the ordinary for my dream to keep happening. And maybe my dreaming was my subconscious self trying to say something like before, how I wanted to learn more and was not ready for a postgraduate life. But to point to Freud's central argument in his book, The Interpretation of Dreams, dreaming is just another form of wisdom wish fulfillment at least when it comes to things we wish we could have done differently. Yet again, I did do something about my need for an education, and I worked hard for it. Could I have done more, and could I still do more with postgraduate education? Yes, but it's also a little dangerous to read too much into what dreams are saying. There's a pretty simple answer why. In the end, dreams are just natural chemical reactions happening in our brain, and just like our lives, they don't extend past our last breath, and we're left on our own in a highly individualized society, with our wish-fulfilling dreams leaving us with more void than satisfaction. And I think that's probably how the protagonist is feeling in Melantonin while dreaming on night 3, and a little bit more during night 4, only they're not discussing life, death, and the meaning of life with anyone else besides themselves. They're having their own personal existential crisis while sleeping, just like everyone else who comes to this realization in real life. In other words, they are their own worst enemy, or boss to be game appropriate. Unlike Sega's classic 1996 game, Nights into Dreams, a game which I have spent countless hours on the Sega Saturn and PC playing and relaxing, there are no bosses to face, no final big baddie to take down. The final struggle is internal and external in melatonin, within the protagonist, and with their outside side world. All of this becomes even more clear on some of the more mundane levels like Night 3's nature level. I love planting flowers and taking care of them as an adult when we get to springtime, but again, planting my own flowers doesn't help solve climate change nor does it have a significant impact on my outdoor space apart from making my front yard a little brighter and more colorful. The creeping thoughts about deforestation and the warming of the planet threaten to interrupt what should be a calming moment of self-care, and thus an activity like garden gardening becomes more about pleasing myself, and if you happen to own a house, it may even become a contest between you and your neighbors as to who has the best front yard garden. It's an act of class privilege to be able to garden your yard, and it's easier to do this and think you're doing something productive as opposed to calling for action against fossil fuel companies continuing to pollute the planet and our politicians sitting on their hands thinking that plastic straw bands are doing something substantial to halt the planet's warming. Again, I realize I'm 
guilty of having a negative interpretation of what's really going on here in the game's universe. But of course, that's not to say that limits the game's engaging gameplay. In fact, it makes the gameplay all the more intriguing because of the ways we try to figure out what our dreams say about ourselves and what must be done. Indeed, the nature level soundtrack and watering sound effects are indeed calming, and it feels satisfying to see plants grow when watered. And once again, when you take the implications of what's going on into consideration, we find that one level has a rather curious place in Night 3, the space level, probably the easiest level on Night 3 to try and get at least an amazing score the first time around if you pay attention to the cues. Putting aside the potential for billionaires to try and run away from a burning, increasingly uninhabitable planet and trying to find a new one with their massive wealth, something like the 2021 film Don't Look Up Mox, I think flying a rocket into space is a pretty good metaphor for the character running away from their individual problems, which once again is an obvious pipe dream because for the majority of us, Earth and maybe even our own country is all we will ever know and all we will have to explore and settle in, and thus when all of the negativity creeps in come the next morning, our game's character is back to the same funk they were in before. Speaking of which, it's only appropriate that the fourth and final night dreams are named Stress, the Past, Desires, and the Future, respectively, and moreover ordered in this way. While the game's soundtrack takes a darker, more sinister turn, the first four levels dealt with the player being a consumer and or whether or not they were getting enough attention. Food, shopping for clothes, shoes and jewelry, gaming and tech, and whether or not you're getting followed enough on social media. The second night with trying to be a more productive adult in society, and the third seeing our character trying to apply self-care and self-help. Yet now our protagonist has opened their eyes from a sleeping meditation, realizing they are in the same situation as before, and also anxious, realizing that the benefits of any self-care and work towards bettering oneself will take a lot of time effort and labor to achieve, even with the dwindling pay that comes with a job or the futility of trying to meditate while being stuck in the same life situation as before. And immediately following night three and waking up, the room is messy again, probably even more so than nights before. And you can tell our protagonist falls into this mental trap because their plants haven't been watered. So to start off this final night, the stress level involves you climbing and jumping towards and up ladders to avoid lava. And here I am reminded of another reoccurring dream I used to have, falling down from somewhere on top, either a building or a flight of stairs, and either going through an endless void or hitting the ground smack down and waking up shaking and sweating, realizing it was all in my head. This definitely is a dream some of you may have had one way or another. It's one thing to feel vertigo when you're high on top of a building, bridge, or mountain, but what happens when your dreams run rampant and you're sure the feeling of falling down is real? Yet here you are back in bed, thankful to wake up the next morning. This kind of dream creates fear and anxiety, and thus, it's a self-justification to procrastinate. To me, the stress level reminds me of the space level the previous night, running away or maybe just procrastinating from something which you know needs to be done but you can't bring yourself to do it. Yet, this level is more direct about it. The stress level is pulling your bootstraps up, but only in panic mode. You thought you were climbing up the ladder of life when in reality, you're climbing in the same place both in the dream world and in reality. If I had to choose a level which was the most annoying to even try and get at least a great score, the past level would be it, where you're burning photographs. The beat here is very chill, but this level was perhaps the easiest one to trip up and hit the space key too early, or even hold on to the key on a long note and be disappointed that the photograph doesn't get burnt completely. Yet, the metaphor here is pretty obvious. When the protagonist is burning photographs with their lighter, they're not even bothering to look at the photographs, or in other words, look back at the past. It's difficult to gather more details here, since the protagonist doesn't have much backstory given, but one positive interpretation here is that they're ready to accept mindfulness completely and be settled with the present moment and not look back. However, another interpretation is that they're ashamed of the past and want to forget even the better moments from way back when. 
The Desires level is probably the sickest level with the sickest beat for both score and hard modes, and the gameplay here is straightforward enough. Here, the Claw Machine, or as it's called here, a Dream Catcher, moves and grabs any desire at random, a donut, jewelry, maybe even some money. However, you have no control over the joystick or buttons as you get in sync with the beat. You just let the machine pick and choose at random which belongings you're going to get. Of course, since this is, in fact, a dream, it's wish fulfillment at its finest with you ending up with a lot of stuff in the end without having to hustle and work for it, a contrast to the reality the protagonist is living. This level revisits many of the previous levels in Nights 1 and 2, only a lot more blatant. I suppose the future level, the last dream for Night 4 has an awesome synth wavy beat and the game changes to a space shooter sort of like the tech level, but I don't think there's much substance to be read here, unlike a lot of the other levels in the game. So, since my interpretation of melatonin takes a much more negative outlook as to what is going on than other gamers and critics, I want to go back to the song I quoted earlier in one of the chapters in this essay, Radiohead's Fitter Happier from their classic 1997 record, OK Computer. While it's not sung by lead singer Tom York, the song is arguably the thesis of the entire record, as, like some of the other songs of the record, the lyrics coldly describe where society was heading back in the mid-90s, and where it was heading in the future, and the obvious hint is that the lyrics are spoken by the AI named Fred, associated with Mac computers from the 90s, perfect for the song given Fred's flat, unemotional, and cold tone. If you think about it, some of the lyrics eerily mirror what the protagonist of Melatonin is going through. Better, happier, more productive, comfortable, not drinking too much, regular exercise at the gym three days a week. So the song starts off positive, young adult life is about finding a balance between living out the last years of your youth and becoming accommodated to adulting. But this requires sacrificing a tremendous amount of your freedom, your own individuality to fit societal expectations, to remove your residual self-image. Concerned, but powerless, an empowered and informed member of society, pragmatism, not idealism. The protagonist also realizes that they're powerless as an individual to help make radical changes to not just their mundane reality outside of dreaming more throughout each night, but find that they don't have the time and means to be part of a larger societal change which could help alleviate class and cultural problems. Come, fitter, healthier, more productive, apic, in a cage, done antibiotics. Thusly, Melantonin's protagonist trying to become a more productive member of society, even with the benefits of dreaming, means they have to become as cold and unemotional as Fred, less focused on the needs of others, and you, like the protagonist, are trapped in a job you don't want, a limited amount of income, and only have the means to consume, like a pig in a cage waiting for the slaughter. You might dismiss my comments and interpretation as a negative overanalysis given the game's simplicity and gameplay, but I think there's plenty of evidence and clues pointing towards the meta-commentary in Melatonin saying more about the anxieties and worries of people my generation and younger have and will continue to feel over the years to come. It's one thing to discuss and try to solve our own individual problems, and sure, things like diet, exercise, and meditation can be beneficial. Maybe sleep and dream a little bit better during the night. However, we live in a world that is constantly filled with problems and issues outside of our control. The ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, climate change and its effects on nature, the lack of universal health care in America, workers not earning enough despite workers putting in more productivity than ever, just to name a few. It would be nice to solve all these problems with a snap of the fingers, or just dream up a solution, like if our dilemmas could be beaten like Atari space shooters. But that's sadly not the case. Again, it wouldn't be appropriate to read too much into your dreams. They are, in fact, random, and it can be difficult to remember them completely the moment you wake up, but it's a lot more difficult to try to rally people up and motivate them to solve one problem or another while dealing with the hurdles of corruption and apathy. And it's quite fitting that the game's ending doesn't even end with a happy one, but rather an ambiguous one, one that, when compared to our own reality, is a very apt conclusion. 
A game like Knights into Dreams sees the two playable characters take the form of knights and overcome their real life struggles, but Melatonin ends with the character realizing that they will have to struggle through the real world once again, just days passing by, nights to have dreams to forget or remember, into the morning where they know they'll have to go through the same cycle again. Again, it is possible to interpret the game's ending as much more positive than how I've tried to analyze here, as it could be the characters solving their existential crisis through their dreams and realizing they'll have to hustle through life to get by, and I can accept that some people can relate to some of the game's elements as actually improving on people's individual habits and behaviors. But then again, when taking in this optimistic read, why end with a happy ending when there's so many obstacles and circumstances the main character has little control over, and the things and activities they do have some semblance of control over can change in an instant, whether they find and keep a job, try to find a romantic partner, etc. The fear and worries over the environment and nature, money and the economy will crawl right back in to remind them no matter what they do to improve themselves, life for the character and everyone else will only get harder as the years go on, and we're powerless to do anything about it besides putting on a mask and pretending to get by. Or maybe I'm just too much of a glass half empty kind of guy to appreciate the game's conclusion a little bit more. We'll keep this section short. Melantonin is such a well-made game, aesthetically, mechanically, and theme-wise, that there aren't really any major complaints about it, even without the lack of a concrete story and plot going on, and it serves its purpose well. Nitpick-wise, however, while I understand that Half Asleep added a level editor to the game, as well as music to go with each level, I, and maybe a few other gamers, feel as if the game is a little TOO short, which limits the amount of enjoyment one might get. Maybe a future DLC might fix this problem or a sequel, but for now, I think a casual gamer who doesn't think too much about the game will probably skim it once for at least an hour long playthrough, and never click on it in their Steam library again. Otherwise, it's not really a major downgrade, since the game's much more focused on relaxation than tension. Well, okay, I'll admit, I felt a lot more pressure trying and failing to achieve perfect scores, or for that matter, amazing scores. So the the weak spots of this game do not affect the overall flow, as you can tell Half Asleep thought ahead of time how they were going to arrange each of the 20 levels in the game and how each level's score and hard mold would be paced. Well, 16 unique levels if you ignore the remix levels at the end of each night and in the morning. Before we close this video essay off, I have to admit, I ran the risk of making this essay less about the game's qualities and mechanics and more about how the game relates to my own life and my experience, and I apologize for that. However, my intention was to try and make whatever analysis, interpretations, and comments I made about the game as relatable to the audience's life experience as possible. Sometimes it's not always the case for each game, and for a majority going into something like melatonin, they just want to fuck around and kill time and relax, which sometimes I did with this game when I wasn't trying to go for a perfect run. And that's understandable. Regardless, Melatonin is a very chillaxing time for anyone to play, casually or for someone who is musically informed. It's got cool, catchy-to-the-eye animation, deeper themes on consumerism and millennials, and a sweet, chill soundtrack, all of which, even with the short duration to beat the game on a regular run, makes it worthwhile to play a few times. And even if you're struggling to beat some of the levels once or maybe trying to achieve a perfect run, just like with any task, chore, or maybe a creative project you've been putting off like I have countless times, Melatonin is a game worth dreaming about during the night, and to beat it here now as the morning comes. Thanks for watching everyone. If you enjoyed this video essay, please comment and like. If you want to see more video essays, please consider subscribing to the Armchair Brain YouTube channel and ring the bell as well to watch discussions on topics in philosophy, art, politics, and video games. Also, please subscribe to my Twitch streaming channel at twitch.tv slash armchairbrain to watch me play video games and occasionally discuss other topics for future video essays.